The third paper then um, looked at non-plaque induced gingival diseases, which is a huge um, array of conditions and lesions that can affect the gingival tissues. And it was important here to be able to discriminate these from um, another group that we're looking at, uh, systemic manifestations of periodontitis that affect the periodontal tissues, the deeper periodontal tissues, the alveolar bone, uh, the root cementum, etc. And so there was some discussion between the different groups within the workshop to make sure that we minimised the overlap in these, in these conditions. And we managed to reduce this complex set of, uh, of, of conditions and lesions to essentially eight categories. So we have the genetic or the developmental disorders. We then have the specific infections. We have various inflammatory and immune conditions that will manifest within the gingival tissues. There are the reactive processes such as the apulides, um, and then there are the neoplasms, both benign and malignant neoplasms. There are then the endocrine, uh, nutritional and metabolic conditions. There are various traumatic lesions. And then finally, there are various forms of gingival pigmentation, whether they be drug induced or, or induced by other uh, exposures that the patient uh, experiences that can cause pigmentation of the gingival tissues. So we reduced this to eight broad categories. And I don't really propose to go through these in detail in this presentation um, because it's a huge area. And I think uh, the authors of this group, uh, of this paper, did a fantastic job in synthesizing those uh, down and, and, and reducing them in the way that we managed to at the end. But just by way of some examples, some are relatively common, such as HGF, or hereditary gingival fibromatosis. This is a, a gene mutation in the son of sevenless gene, son of sevenless one or two genes, that can give rise to a, a fibrotic thickening and enlargement, um, classically manifesting in the maxillary tuberosities or the mandibular retromolar pad areas. But in truth, if you uh, ignore the literature, and you base your uh, experience on, on 30 years of clinical uh, life, then you come to realize that actually it can manifest, as you see here, in the anterior regions of the mouth quite commonly as well. There are rarer genetic conditions. The example shown here is a, a genetic condition called juvenile hyaline fibromatosis. It's, it's a very rare and, and a very um, debilitating condition these patients often don't survive the first few years of life, and if they do, they live in a wheelchair. But the reason it's important for us as uh, dental clinicians is managing to debulk the gingival conditions uh, in these patients surgically can massively improve their quality of life and can improve their longevity because the patient you see here was unable to eat uh, a normal diet. Once we gradually worked through and reduced the overgrowth, uh, he was able to eat pizza and live a relatively normal life, so his quality of life improved hugely. And then there are academic debates about um, hamartomatous type conditions. This one, sebaceous nevus of Jadison, you see here, is, is an unusual condition uh, whereby um, basically you get a migration uh, of the sebaceous glands along hereditary lines of Blaschko, as they're called, in the face, and they can give rise to a nevus that can affect uh, the skin on the face as well as the gingival tissues. And there's a debate in the dermatology community as to whether this is uh, an ectodermal condition or a mesodermal condition. And as periodontists, we were able to solve that dilemma for them uh, by examining the gingival tissues. So group two are the specific infections, which are very common. You'll have seen these. Uh, the first one here shows you gingival herpes simplex one. This is obviously an adult. Um, normally this presents within the first two years of life in childhood, uh, but the ulceration is very different to what you would see with necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, for example, because the ulcers affect the marginal gingivae. They're very shallow and ragged and serpiginous in nature, and, and the patient presents with pain and discomfort, which is what, not what you would expect from a chronic plaque-induced gingivitis. And in the middle, we have a, a viral wart here. This is a, a molluscum contagiosum, which is becoming more common uh, in the population in general now. Um, and this is diagnosed by biopsy. Um, fortunately, this lesion is pedunculated. It doesn't look it in the two-dimensional photograph, but actually it's, it's born on a small stalk. And so in this young patient, we're able to excise it uh, without deforming the gingival tissues 
um, and then we can make the diagnosis histologically. And then there are fungal infections, and in the case here, a deep fungal infection, histoplasma capsulatum, is an important diagnosis to make because it's, uh, it tends to only manifest in people who have a very, very severe uh, immune suppression. And this two-year-old child you'll probably notice is on the operating table um, and had a very, very severe um, hereditary immune deficiency and sadly didn't survive beyond 18 months of age. But the diagnosis here was of histoplasmosis um, as opposed to a traditional candidosis or in fact what looks on this photograph like a necrotizing periodontitis, but clearly it wasn't. Then we have the inflammatory and immune conditions and there are many of these. Um, the examples I've shown here um, are perhaps slightly rare on the top and more common on the bottom. Um, disseminated pyogenic granulomas are if you like pyogenic granulomas, but they can affect the skin and can be disseminated throughout the body. They can in, even involve the central nervous system and the spinal cord. So we're in a unique position uh, because the mouth is accessible to be able to biopsy these lesions and, and, and come up with a diagnosis that may inform medical management of the patient and avoid the need for spinal surgery, for example, which was the case in, in this particular patient. Plasma cell gingivitis is, is an, an atopic or an allergic reaction to something, either in foods or in the environment. Um, it can be very, very recalcitrant and very difficult to treat. And in the case, in the top middle image here, uh, this progressed to the vocal cords and the patient lost their voice and then had difficulty breathing. So again, our diagnosis was important because it dictated medical management involving corticosteroids as opposed to the need to surgically biopsy the vocal cords, which could have led to a permanent uh, deformity and loss of voice. So again, we shouldn't underestimate our role as dental clinicians and as periodontists in, in, in managing the systemic manifestations of gingival conditions. Then on the top uh, right image here, you see a C1 esterase inhibitor dysfunction. Uh, and this again uh, is a patient who suffers from a condition where they're deficient in an inhibitor of C1 esterase. Now, C1 esterase is the enzyme that activates complement C1, so it triggers inflammation. So if you're deficient in the inhibitor, then you just produce too, in too much inflammation and you don't switch it off. So what you see here is a very uh, edematous, enlarged gingival tissue due to an overreaction um, if you like, to, uh, to the plaque that was accumulating. The patient's got a relatively um, clean mouth. And what was interesting in this patient was, in fact, this led to destruction of the alveolar bone and over a 30-year period eventually led to total tooth loss, not because of the plaque uh, directly, but because of this really exaggerated in inflammatory response because of the C1 inhibitor deficiency. Then lichen planus, you'll be familiar with. This is a very common condition presenting here on the gingival tissues as what we call a desquamative gingivitis. So you have areas of erosion and redness. Um, erosion is thinning of the gingival tissues. And if they thin too far, then you get frank ulceration. And then the bottom middle image shows you erythema multiforme, which is uh, clearly an ulcerative condition, as you can see here, that looks a little bit like herpes. And the way to discriminate it from herpes is by following very carefully that anatomical landmark I mentioned earlier on of the mucogingival line, because it dips down over the lateral incisors here in this patient. And in fact, the ulceration doesn't involve the gingivae itself. Uh, the gingivae are spared. And gingival sparing is fairly classic of erythema multiforme, as opposed to herpes simplex. So it's, a, it's one of the ways we can distinguish the two conditions. The other way is that erythema multiforme is a sterile condition. It's, if you like, a type of hypersensitivity reaction either to residual particles of the herpes virus uh, or possibly to drugs. Um, so patients may start a drug and develop this uh, allergic reaction, this hypersensitivity reaction that gives rise to both oral and genital ulceration. So the history is important here in, also in making the diagnosis. And then finally, on the bottom right, we have an example of systemic lupus, erythematosus, or SLE. Again, here presenting as a disquamative gingivitis, different to lichen planus, um, but the clinical manifestation can be the same. And so that clinical description of disquamative gingivitis requires further investigations 
in order to determine what the true underlying pathology and disease is that, that is causing the, the discriminative appearance to the gingival tissues. So the reactive processes are the apulides. You will see these regularly in practice, I'm sure. We have the fibrous epulis. We have a vascular epulis, which is also known as a pyogenic granuloma, um, or a pregnancy epulis if it arises in uh, a pregnant female. Um, and that represents an exaggerated response to the accumulation of plaque at a localised site. And then on the bottom right-hand image here, we have a giant cell granuloma, a peripheral giant cell granuloma that has grown to quite some size. So these are reactive uh, lesions. It's important to x-ray the patient to find out if there is something subgingivally that is triggering this response, uh, because actually excising the lesion is one thing, but if we don't identify the cause and treat the cause, it will only come back and require further surgery. So we need to think about medical management as well as surgical management in these cases and remove the subgingival ledge on the restoration or the calculus or whatever it is that appears to be triggering uh, the development of this localised response. Next are the neoplastic conditions and these obviously are uh, life-threatening and therefore early diagnosis is critically important for patient survival. And I've put some examples here on the left of a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, you'll note that this swelling exceeds uh, the mucogingival line, so this cannot be a plaque-induced lesion because the swelling goes beyond the mucogingival line and up into the sulcus. And it's really important also to physically feel and palpate these lesions uh, because tumours, particularly malignant tumours, feel very hard and rubbery. Um, it's, it, it's known as induration and that's a very, very important sign. You'll also note uh, a, a, an ulceration or a breakdown in the middle of the lymphoma because the tumour is growing at such a rapid rate, it's outgrowing its blood supply, and so we get necrosis in the centre. Next, we have the chondrosarcoma. Again, anatomically, that swelling is exceeding beyond uh, the mucogingival line and progressing up into the sulcus. And again, this lesion feels very hard and rubbery in nature. Um, and so it's clearly an unpleasant lesion. You can see hemorrhagic changes within it as well. And chondrosarcomas are rare, but they're also incredibly um, aggressive. And this particular lesion had extended right up to the base of the skull. So it was very important to um, send the tissue to pathology, uh, to do an incisional biopsy. So if you suspect malignancy, never remove the whole lesion. It's important just to take a piece of the lesion and so if the diagnosis does come back as a malignant tumour, then the lesion is still there and the surgeon who then is responsible for its complete excision knows exactly where the margins are because you haven't removed them during the biopsy. Then we have um, perhaps more common, uh, but fortunately still um, not that common, a gingival squamous cell carcinoma. This is a superficial spreading gingival squamous cell carcinoma. Again, you can see ulceration in the middle of the tumour. And when you palpate and feel the gingival tissues, again, they feel indurated and somewhat hard. They don't have that nice, uh, if you like, um, relaxed uh, and elastic feel um, to normal gingival tissues. And then there are um, pre-malignant lesions. Uh, this one, a proliferative verrucous leukoplakia, is not actually um, a squamous cell carcinoma, but it has over 95% likelihood of transforming into a squamous cell carcinoma. And so this provides us with the opportunity to have a conversation with our patient and counsel the patient about whether they wish to have it excised at this point in time as a block removal, including a couple of teeth, uh, before it actually changes into something that would require a much more aggressive surgical intervention. Um, and that's an important part of the early diagnostic process and the planning uh, process. Group six are the endocrine, the nutritional and the metabolic disorders. These would include um, rare lesions such as the giant cell tumour of bone you see here. This is in fact the same patient and this has arisen around two implants. Uh, the implants really uh, are unlikely to have caused this, but they are associated with it. Uh, and therefore they have to be removed as part, of the, uh, as part of the treatment of this condition. And then, perhaps not as uncommon as you may think, um, the nutritional disorders, this young 19-year-old uh, patient on the far right-hand side is suffering from vitamin C deficiency and severe vitamin 
uh, C deficiency, so they have scurvy. And we have an atypical ulceration uh, of the tissues here, an exposure of alveolar bone. Looks very much like uh, an atypical necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, but it's not. And it won't respond to treatment with metronidazole or, in fact, with uh, a broader spectrum antibiotic like penicillin. Uh, but it will respond to um, vitamin C supplementation and the tissues re-epithelialized within two weeks of that supplementation. Group 7 are the traumatic lesions, and these can in view in, in include chemical trauma, as you see here from cocaine-induced ulceration and avascular necrosis, giving rise to periodontal uh, attachment loss, gingival recession. Or it could be trauma that's physically induced uh, by the patient themselves. We would call that a, a factitious injury, where the patient is literally scratching away at the gingival tissues, and this is really about attention-seeking. Uh, and it's very important to think about the mental health of patients like this and to seek perhaps a psychological or even a psychiatric opinion uh, to help manage the underlying medical reason for the development of this traumatic um, lesion. The way to diagnose it is to simply ask the patient to point to the area that is uh, the problem and you'll see a fingernail will go straight to it. Or if you disclose the root surface itself, you'll find no plaque because the patient has scratched the plaque away. And if you look at the gingival margin, you can see it, it's keratotic. There's thickening and hyperkeratosis from the trauma of the constant uh, scratching by the fingernail in this, in this particular situation. And then uh, finally, group eight are the pigmented lesions. Here you see an example of a drug-induced pigmentation. This can happen with drugs like hydroxychloroquine, which can be used in the treatment of lupus, for example, or or certain drugs that are used for prevention of malaria, prophylaxis against malaria. In this case, uh, AZT is an antiretroviral drug used in the management of AZT, and you can see this patient has a nodular pigmentation as a result of the AZT therapy. And then sometimes in smokers, uh, you can see a brown or sometimes a slaty gray pigmentation of the gingival uh, tissues develops uh, a condition known as smoker's melanosis.